This is my 100 year old Syracuse Sanding Company 15 inch disc sander that I just picked up. Today I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of this sander, what accessories came with it, how original the condition is, what's been added to it, and what makes this particular sander so special. I might even throw in how much I paid for it at the end of the video. If you guys are interested in this, stick around. Syracuse Sander Company started out in 1916 as the pioneer dustless disc company of Syracuse. This company only made one tool, which is the 15 inch disc sander known as the D1 with its innovative integrated dust collection design. In 1917, the company changed names to the Carter and Buckholtz Company Incorporated, and they added a new 9-inch disc sander as well as an oscillating spindle sander to their catalog. In March 1918, the company name was once again changed to the Syracuse Sander Manufacturing Company. Syracuse Sander only lasted from 1918 to 1922, and in that time they expanded their catalog to include belt sanders, band saws, and wood lathes. In 1922, Porter Cable purchased the Syracuse Sander Company. They continued to manufacture the Syracuse sanding machine for several years under the Porter Cable name. The product line was subsequently sold to Engelberg, Inc., then the Sunstrand Corporation, and then finally to Acme Manufacturing. The Syracuse sanding line has long since been discontinued and you can't find much information about the company anymore besides what can be found on VintageMachinery.org. My specific model is the D2 sander. It was designed for both sanding wood and grinding metal. Let's get a better look at it right now. So this is how I received the sander. I did verify that it works before I bought it. This is the 15 inch platen that the sandpaper runs on. It has this awesome brass light fixture and the fixture is just wired in to the main power so it is aftermarket but whoever installed it made this nice little sheet metal platform for it to attach to it's actually pretty decent um, it definitely goes with the time period so I plan on leaving it as you can see with the green paint and the inventory tags. There's a good chance that this sat in an industrial shop or maybe some type of a military facility for many, many years um, being used. The power switch has been relocated and replaced. Originally, the power switch would have been down below here, but I actually like that it's right here um, behind the disc of the disc sander. Not too sure what this shelf is for. Um, every um, picture I've seen of one of these D2 sanders has this shelf here. Here is the table that attaches to the sander. I will attach it momentarily. It uses a very cool ball and socket style attachment with a little spring-loaded detent here. Um, it attaches to this arm and then it uses this rack and pinion style adjuster to adjust the angle of the table. And as I was preparing for this video, I was giving this sander a really good look over and I did notice that one of the pivot points has been repaired. Um, there is a pretty heavy duty braze job that's taken place. Let me flip this over. And you can see it better right here. Um, but whoever did the work did a great job and they restored this um, pivot hole here. And this is absolutely necessary to be able to mount this table to this sander. As you can see, they have these little spikes on either side and this one is attached to a screw and that's how you lock it into position. Along with the sander, I received a ton of these 40 grit discs. There's probably 20 of them there and then a wooden pattern to cut out um, more 15 inch discs. And then I also received a second platen, a, a second disc. 
to attach the uh, sandpaper to. I'm not sure why, <laughs> but I'm glad I have it. Um, and looking at the back of the platen, you get a good idea of one of the innovations of the Syracuse Sanding Company uh, disc sander here, and it's these fins that are on the back of the platen. So if you look <clears throat> underneath the disc sander here, you'll see this pipe, and it looks like a piece of conduit, but actually what it is, is it's a dust collection port. So those little fins on the back of the platen force the dust down. You can see that, it, that it, the intake of this dust collection hose is actually facing toward the right side of the of the disc sander and that's because this disc sander turns in this direction so the idea is any dust that is removed comes down here and is with those fins is pushed down this pipe and then it shoots out the bottom now somebody made their own custom shroud here that goes over the bottom and I'm not sure if that was put in place to keep the dust contained underneath the sander or what the case may be, but I may con I may use this and then adapt it for a dust collection fitting, or I may eliminate this altogether because this isn't original to the machine, and then figure out a way to attach my dust collector to the underside of this. And I think the dust collection on this sander is gonna be phenomenal because of all of these small innovations that were part of this disc sander when it was invented over 100 years ago. So the only parts that are missing that I'm aware of are there is a um, like a, a shield, a protective shield that uh, attaches to a hole right here, and that is missing. And then the original power switch is missing. I'm not too concerned about that. It still has the table. It has all the adjustments for the tilt angle of the table. It comes with the spare platen. Everything is in great condition. Nothing is broken. The parts that had broken in the past have already been repaired. It comes with its original tag, which I think is awesome. It actually has the original motor attached to it still, which is a half horsepower GE motor. So what I'm gonna do now is I'll, I'll take one of these pieces of sandpaper, I'll clean up this platen, glue the sandpaper on, attach the table, and uh, we'll give this thing a little test ride. I just used some brake parts cleaner to break up all that built up glue that was on there. It felt like rubber cement. It could have been some spray adhesive, but it's some it was something pretty pretty strong. All right, so there it is all set up. I really love the quick release nature of this table here. Um, I'm able to take it off and reinstall it in you know, less than 30 seconds each way. So that makes, that'll make changing out the sandpaper pretty easy. The sandpaper is just ever so slightly larger than the platen, but I don't think it'll be an issue. It may cause a little bit of rubbing, but nothing too terrible. As much as I love this this fabric clad cable, I'm probably going to have to replace it. First of all, it's probably loaded with asbestos. But second of all, this splice right here is just, I don't know, a little sketchy at best. And then this plug is, I mean, this thing is ancient. I, this, 
I wouldn't be surprised if this was the original cord and plug for this unit. As you can see, this was by, the plug is by D. Woodhead Company in Chicago, Illinois. It is a two-prong, non-polarized. My biggest concern is all of this exposed, the, you know, the, the terminals are exposed here. So it, there's no real strain relief on it, and I don't know. I might hang, I might keep the cable because it seems to still be in really good shape, but I'm going to have to rewire this light and get everything kind of where it belongs, or at least get it in a safer state. There is a, if you listen, there is a slight rumble to the bearing in the motor. Um, I guess what I end up doing about it will depend on what I decide to do with this. I plan on keeping this, but I don't know what I'm going to do. But I'll talk about that after I do a little demonstration. So right now I'm going to grab myself a piece of wood, turn it on, and we'll see how this guy works. All right, so let's see how good that dust collection worked. I'll pick up the shroud here and slide the sander out of the way. So there you go. As you can see, it directed the sawdust down to the floor like designed, so that's pretty nice. Uh, like I said, if I couple this with a dust collector, this thing will be super clean, so. I'm pretty happy about that. As you can see, it performed really well on pine as well as oak, and it was able to sand the oak effortlessly without burning. It has a lot of power. The rated power is half a horsepower, but you know, that's a half a horsepower from 1918 which is probably a lot more than what a half house half a horsepower from today would be well i'm pretty thrilled with this purchase i did spend a pretty penny for it as far as a 100 year old machine goes it cost me about 250 dollars but if you compare that to any 15 inch disc sander that's available on the market today it's a steal any way you look at it so what should I do with this sander? Should I just use it as is? Should I do a full restore? Should I do something in between? It works just fine as it is. It's just a little ugly. Um, I am going to have to do something with the electrical, just for my own personal safety. But besides that, I'm keeping the lamp. I think it looks awesome and it fits the time period. Um, you know, this thing is about 95% complete. I can always come up with a solution for the protective guard over here if I decide that I want to put one on. Um, but let me know what you think. What do you think I should do? 
and um, if uh, enough suggestions vote one way or the other, uh, maybe that's what I'll do. So uh, stay tuned for future videos about this. Go ahead and hit that subscribe button so you don't miss out on anything. And I will be sure to get an update once I get some things figured out and once I decide what I want to do with this. So thanks everybody for watching. I'll see you in the next one.